Almighty God, we pray for your blessing upon this council. Help and prosper its work for the advancement and benefit of its people, so that peace and happiness, unity and justice may be established amongst us all. Amen. Please be seated. Manningham City Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land we now know as Manningham. We pay our respects to Wurundjeri elders, past and present, and value the ongoing contribution to the cultural heritage of Manningham. Manningham Council would also like to acknowledge the contribution made to Manningham over the years by people of diverse backgrounds and cultures. I'd like to welcome all members of the public who've joined us in person and online to observe tonight's pr proceedings. As you are no doubt aware, the State Government introduced new restrictions today regarding mask wearing and gatherings. We're currently awaiting a formal decision from the Department of Health and Human Services regarding these restrictions. As a precaution, we have made changes to the seating arrangement for tonight's meeting. And I and councillors and officers and members of the public will be required to wear masks inside unless they are exempt. When speaking to the meeting, councillors and officers may remove their masks in accordance with the current guidelines. Tonight's meeting is being audio and video recorded. All care will be taken to maintain your privacy. However, as a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded. By remaining in the gallery, it is assumed your consent is given in the event that your voice and or image is broadcast by council. As with all council meetings, we are taking questions from the public and encourage you to submit your questions in accordance with our normal practice. Tonight, all questions will be read out by our CEO. A response will be provided where we have the information to hand. If we're unable to provide a meaningful response, we will take your question on notice and provide a response in writing. We'll deal with a maximum of two questions per person and two questions on any one issue. If you have more than two questions, please submit these additional questions in writing through our normal channels. Council meetings are governed by Manningham's governance rules. I'll introduce each item of business as listed on the agenda, calling it by number and by reading the title. I'll then call for a mover and seconder of the motion on, of a motion on the item before opening any debate. Only councillors are able to join the debate on an item. Councillors may adopt the officer's recommendation in the report or propose amendments and supplementary motions. And that takes us to item two, which is apologies and requests for leave of absence. There are no apologies. Item three, prior notification of conflict of interest. No prior notifications of conflict of interest have been received. Councillors, would anyone like to give a notice of conflict of interest at this time? No, thank you. Item four, confirmation of minutes. Do I have a mover? Councillor Chen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the minutes of the council meeting held on 27th April 2021 be confirmed. Thank you, Councillor Chen. And do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. I will put that motion to the floor. Those in favour? And carried unanimously. Thank you. Item six, sorry, item five, presentations. There are no presentations. Item six, petitions. We have a petition for the permanent closure of Arundel Road at Park Road Park Orchards in the Yarra Ward. Do I have a mover for this petition? Carps, sorry, Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to move that the petition with 33 signatories from the residents seeking the permanent closure of Arundel Road at Park Road for the safety and welfare of the community be received and referred through the appropriate officer for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Lang, and do I have a seconder? Councillor Lightbody. I will put that motion. Those in favour? And those carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 6.2, joint letter, removal of trees on the nature strip in Lyons Place, Doncaster East, Karawong Ward. Do I have a mover? I'll move. Thank you. Councillor Goff? I move that the petition... Uh, that the joint letter was... Sorry, the joint letter be uh, submitted and uh, referred to appropriate... I'll, I'll, I'll get you to read the whole motion. Yeah, That'd be great. 
six point two. A letter to remove trees on the nature strip in Lions Road, Lions Place, Doncaster East, Carrollon Ward. This is a joint letter, and uh, it's not being made available to the public gallery. And I will read it. That the joint letter with three signatures requesting the removal of the newly planted trees on the nature strip found in front of properties six, seven, and nine Lions Place, Doncaster East, be received and referred through the appropriate officer for consideration. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Chen. And I'll put that motion. Those in favour? And carried unanimously. Thank you. Item seven, public question time. We've received two questions from Ms Louise Kerramaris. Our CEO will read out Louise's questions. Thank you, Mayor. The first question is, in implementing each of the 12 recommendations from the community panel, could Council ensure that there is co-design with the Wurundjeri Council to also reflect the aspirations of our First Nations people and also to ensure an interface with Council's Reconciliation Action Plan? Ms Keramaris, thank you for your first question. I'll ask Karen Peterson, Group Manager, People and Communications, to please respond. Uh, thank you, Ms Karamaras, for your question. Council is currently in the process of developing our reconciliation action plan, working in close consultation uh, with the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation, Reconciliation Australia, and our Reconciliation Action Plan Working Group. The development of this plan is well progressed, and we are looking forward to inviting the community to provide feedback on the draft in the not too distant future. It is proposed that the 12 recommendations from the community panel will be tabled at the next round of culture consultation with the elders of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Corporation and also the RAP Working Group, which comprises of members of the community, organisations as well as council officers. We will be guided by the elders and the RAP Working Group as to how they would like to engage with the panel recommendations and the community vision going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And the second question is, given the flag policy includes flying the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag, can council visibly include the two flags within the council chamber so they are visible? Again, thank you, Ms Karamaris, for your question. As this question relates to our flag flying protocols, I'll ask Andrew McMaster, Group Manager, Legal, Governance and Risk, to please respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Karamaris. Uh, following recent discussion at the April Council meeting about Council's flag flying policy, uh, a wholesale review of the policy has actually already commenced. Uh, your request to fly the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags in the Chamber is one of several matters which has been considered as part of the review. Uh, the Council will be briefed on this and other options available for a new flag flying policy in the coming months with a view to adopting it shortly after. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Were there any further questions? No, thank you. Um, item eight, admission of urgent business. There are no items of urgent business. Item nine, planning permit applications. 9.1, planning application PLN 20 0447 for construction of a part six storey, part seven storey residential apartment building containing 93 dwellings at Tullamore 57 Stables Circuit, Doncaster. Um, do I have a mover for the motion? Councillor Diamante? I move that the recommendation be adopted. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Laura Main? Thank you. Councillor Diamante, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I support the council officer's recommendation to issue a planning permit for building C within Tullamore Estate alongside the other um, apartment complexes, Folia and Phoenix. I also support the officer's recommendations to modify the western and eastern facades, in particular as they currently present as a sheer grey wall on either side. 
um, and present that to surrounding residents. And I also support the officer's recommendation for the use of mature trees to screen and soften that building form, in particular to the east of the building, where it faces residents at the end of Arnold Grove and the Tullamore Estate residents that are only about 10 metres away from that edge of this proposed building. Um, those that will know me will know that I did campaign on a platform of supporting development, but not overdevelopment, um, and particularly where that overdevelopment impacts amenity, uh, sunlight, privacy, safety, a pleasant vista, greenery, trees are important, and they're often reasons why people move to Manningham. Certainly, for me, this building C does represent um, some overdevelopment of the Tullamore estate. However, I am pragmatic to understand that the building does comply with planning requirements. And further than this, the developer has taken some significant steps to reduce that amenity impact to the surrounding residents in its design. For example, the, the top storey level has had a significant setback, reducing that visual bulk for residents around the building. The building does also include quite a lot of landscaping and it does include a green courtyard area um, along the east tower, providing some screening and privacy to the closest neighbours within Tullamore Estate and, as I also mentioned, Arnold Grove. Um, the building does actually, I think, have a lovely design as you come up Doncaster Road as well, and I think it complements Folia and Phoenix as you drive up Doncaster Road. Uh, the, the modification of the eastern and western facades that are in the officer's report, including the use of mature trees, is to add the amenity for, for residents. The development caters for parking. It is, um, there are enough resident parking. It is in a major public transport zone, and I've learnt that visitor parking is not required, but the developer has put in 18 visitor spots, which is very good. And I note that not far from that site, closer to Phoenix, there is also visitor car parks, which will be also used for the Stables Cafe when that's open very soon. My main concern with this proposal is with traffic and the street safety around the entire estate. I've met with residents of the Tullamore Estate over the last few months and by far their biggest issue is street safety. The streets around the estate are narrow and in some instances form a single lane. Um, because the estate is home to many families, there are often more than two cars per household. This and visitors does mean that there are a lot of cars parked on the sides of the streets. Combined with the narrow streets, there's also tight bends. Driving at speed around the Tullamore Estate can be dangerous. And there are also young children. It's a, it's a family estate. There are young children that use the streets to ride their bikes. So, Mr Mayor, I do wish to foreshadow that I intend to move a subsequent motion regarding a review of traffic conditions within the estate. This is not an additional condition to this planning permit. But with 93 new dwellings and perhaps up to 150 additional cars around this state, I do think safety of the streets must be a consideration of both council and of the developer. Of this, on this theme, I do actually support the officer's recommendation in the planning permit um, for no stopping restriction signs along the stable circuit in the entrance and exit to this new building. I also want to make a final note about community consultation because I have had a number of residents ask me why did we not get to see these plans. Um, community consultation was not undertaken as the proposals were consistent with the approved development plan for the estate. And I have learned as well, unlike typical planning applications um, on land that is not subject to a development plan, applications within Tullamore are exempt from notification under planning legislation. This is due to the extensive planning scheme amendment process that was undertaken when the development plan was developed. So I move that the recommendation be adopted. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Diamante. Councillor Laura Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Would anyone else, well, sorry, would anyone like to speak against the motion? No, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? 
Councillor Stephen May. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I'll, um, I'll be voting in favour of this uh, proposal. Just, yep. I'll be voting in favour of this proposal as well, and I agree with much of what uh, Councillor Diamonte has said, I think, particularly on the traffic. Um, and I was just going to mention to, to Mervac that a, a, a car share scheme might be one, one thing to look at. Uh, and our council is looking at it down the track in order to, uh, to reduce uh, the congestion and the amount of car ownership uh, on the estate. Um, I think it's worth dwelling a little bit on the history of this site. Uh, it was sold, well, the contracts were exchanged in 2011. Uh, and our councillor Goff and I were on council back when that happened, when the golf, Eastern Golf Course sold. And um, a decade later, this is the final permit that will be issued. Um, it's been through, was been, went through four years of uh, planning and it didn't settle, the site didn't settle until uh, July 2015. And if you look at the original statements that Mervac made, uh, they were envisaging, uh, I think it was uh, a $400 million uh, development with 621 lots. And we finished up with uh, an $876 million uh, development with 914 lots. So it certainly has grown uh, from what was initially envisaged, but it is consistent with the development plan, uh, which was all signed off in 2015. This component, the apartment component, has finished up a little better, a little bigger overall. There's 330 apartments in these three along Doncaster Road when the development plan talked about between 200 and 300. But I think if you read the officer report, um, the explanation on the height, uh, I think, is understandable and explainable. I agree that the, the design uh, is good. And I think it all, all round, it has been a very successful uh, development. There was quite a lot of anxiety about Eastern Gulf being sold. We were gifted 20% of the site, or 12 hectares, as open space. Um, it is costing us a fair bit to maintain, but it is a nice addition to our, our portfolio of open space. And if you look at Mervac's uh, stock exchange announcements, they often feature uh, this particular development on the cover when they're talking about their national residential development. So over the last 10 years, so it has been they they regard it as being one of their best. They're very proud of it. I think if you look at it, you can see why. Um, and the time frame, I think, is the other interesting thing is that it will continue all the way until 2026 is what they're now talking about. Uh, when initially, I think it was going to finish at 2020. So they've taken their time. They've done it well. It's been very successful. Councils play a very proactive and supportive role uh, all along the way. I think that the Mervac's been very pleased with the way they've engaged. Our officers have done a good job. Uh, and I do think this uh, should be supported. And I do hope that Mervac can think about, uh, given it's been such a successful development, maybe investing in a car share scheme uh, or even maybe contributing a little bit that might help us with the cost of maintaining the open space. Um, but uh, overall, I think it's a good development and should be supported. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Were there any other speakers to the motion? There being no speakers against, I'll put that in motion. Those in favour? And carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Um, Councillor Diamante, you did foreshadow a subsequent motion. Would you like to move your subsequent motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I move that Council's traffic engineering team undertake a review of traffic conditions within Tullamore Estate with particular regards to traffic flow and on-street vehicle parking and prepare a report to Council and Mervac on the review's findings and any further action recommended to address any safety issues identified. Thank you, thank you Councillor Diamante. Is there a seconder? Councillor Laura Main. Councillor Diamante, do you need to speak to it? It won't be as long as the first time. Um, so I had spoken previously under that previous motion on traffic. While compliant, the streets are narrow and there are also parts of the estate where the roads actually narrow to a single lane, including outside the new fitness club. Narrow streets are compounded by very tight bends. Anyone that's gone there will know it's a series of loops and quadrangles, so there are a number of bends. Frequently cars park on these bends, meaning that any car approaching a bend is actually blind to any car coming down, compounded by quite narrow, um, narrow streets. On Saturday, with a group of residents, I stood at the corner of Stable Circuit, which is the main street leading to the three apartments. And I have to say, without a doubt, it was chaotic. Um, and that was, that was 10 a.m. Saturday morning. Sadly, cars also speed 
around that estate. The other quirk of the estate is that there is a single main entrance and exit point off Doncaster Road. This means that traffic is actually being funnelled the whole time through those main streets. True, there is a small entrance point to the rear of the estate, but that then opens into a very quiet residential street. Uh, enhancing traffic conditions, in my view, such as one-way streets, given that a lot of the streets are loops, no standing zones on bends, which Mervac has already started to do in some of those boulevards, speed humps, or even lower speed limits are all measures that I would encourage the council and MERVAC to consider. Thank you, Councillor Diamante. Councillor Laura May, would you like to speak further? Would anyone else like? To, would anyone like to speak against the motion? Anyone else like to speak for the motion? I'll put that motion. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 10, City Planning and Community. Item 10.1, Yarra Strategic Plan, endorsement of the plan. Do I have a mover? Councillor Kleinert? That the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Lang? Councillor Kleinert, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. So um, this is basically uh, uh, the first, uh, this is a, a plan that uh, Melbourne Waters, the lead agency, um, two, I was going to say the name, but I'm so scared that I will actually pronounce it wrong. It's got the beautiful name to it, if I can find it. But um, the, Yarra, uh, the Yarra River flows uh, across from the Mount of Borbor right through to um, Port Phillip. It's 242 kilometres of, of river, of which a large component of that flows uh, through Manningham, through um, the Yarra Ward, um, also through Westfolds Ward and also part of Bolland Ward and a touch of, of Ruffy. I've got it that all right. Um, there are uh, multiple agencies that are, are um, uh, part, of, uh, part of this. Um, the draft, it's a draft plan that's been prepared by Melbourne Water uh, and as they're the lead agency. It's a collaboration um, of, of a whole group of authorities that have fed into the process of which we have. When it went out to a, a public consultation, Manningham was one of 138 uh, um, applications or, or uh, people putting in feedback. Um, it affects land on uh, either side of the Yarra to uh, one kilometre of each side. Uh, a lot of the themes are consistent with uh, actually the council plan, which includes um, healthy communities, uh, livable um, places and spaces, resilient environment and vibrant and prosperous um, economy. So it does fit in very uh, well. So it's the, this is the preparation and implementation of the plan um, is a requirement of the Yarra River, Yarra River Protection. Now, here we go. The Willop Gin Burrung Murrum Act of 2017. It's a beautiful name um, and it basically, um, that calls for the collaborative management of the Yarra River Corridor. Um, this is really a, a process, a lot of, uh, uh, this is actually a, a part of it's confidential because we're not the agency putting it out once the documents have all been collated. And, and I gather um, there's many other uh, councils uh, that the Yarra flows through that will have to do just what we're doing. Once that's complete and um, Yarra, River, uh, Yarra Water have got uh, everything together, then it goes out to the public, hence a portion of this has been confidential. So not that we're hiding anything, we're just going through the proper process and respecting that they're the lead and um, that'll be released through them. I think it's wonderful. Um, it really preserves and protects um, the Yarra River corridor, which is so important to us, important to our city. And um, it's a 10-year plan which flows on um, with a 50-year vision, which I think is really exciting. Uh, this didn't happen overnight. It's uh, started a few years ago, the process. So it's been a, a long and um, very transparent uh, process. And um, it's been wonderful that Manningham's been there along the way to contribute to, to it for a, a very good outcome for us. It's a really, um, it's, it's quite interesting because um, the draft's been prepared at the same time as we've got um, some major things happening in our city, including the North East Link project, uh, the proposed soccer facility, uh, Yarra River um, Bulleen Precinct, Precinct Land Use uh, Framework Plan, uh, Suburban Loop, Fitzsimons um, Lane Upgrade, which really interesting enough, they're all state government projects. Um, 
but you know it's it's a really important part and, and piece. So there's a there's a lot of um, lot of pieces to the puzzle. But all in all, um, we're we're um, going through the process and we're um, adopting the the draft tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kleiner. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Kleinert actually said most of it very well, so <laughs> well done. Um, I, and I guess what you see from this is, a, is very much a bicultural approach. So it is protecting the um, Yarra River and the Green, Ledge, um, Green Wedge land, as well as our Aboriginal and historical sites along that um, land and parkland and, and that open space. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Lang. Would anyone like to speak against the motion? Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? There be no speakers against. I'll put that motion. Those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. Item 10.2, tackling ageism together. Every age counts in Melbourne's east. Do I have a mover? Councillor Chen. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Goff. Councillor Chen, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, I do. Mr Mayor, ageism refers to prejudice and discrimination on the grounds of a person's age and is the most invisible form of discrimination. While there is some awareness of gender, racial and socioeconomic discrimination, Asianism has received less attention. Younger adults may have difficulty finding jobs and receive lower pay because of their perceived lack of experience. But when we reach a certain age, we may have problems achieving promotions, finding new work, and changing careers. Every Age Counts is an advocacy campaign and at tackling, uh, tackling uh, ageism. It is still a, a new term for me. <laughs> the campaign is led by a broad-based uh, broad national coalition of individuals and organizations committed to tackling ageism. The Eastern Metropolitan Region Councils are collaborating on tackling ageism together in Melbourne's East. Like much of Melbourne, Manningham population is Asian, with 27% of Manningham residents aged 60 and above. We will all be older one day. If we all get involved with ending ageism against older people now, we will also be ending discrimination against our future selves. Council can support the campaign and to raise awareness by signing the Every Age Counts, the pledge, and ensuring that tackling ageism is considered in the development of new strategic plans. I also wish to raise a particular issue about digital ageism. It is increasingly required for accessing essential information and taking part in the digital economy and go paperless. While many older people are online, we cannot deny the fact that many still may not have access to internet or do not have full confidence or skills in using it. Older people without skills and access are being locked out. For business and organizations, going paperless is obviously a cost-cutting measure. But how much, just how much will they save doing this to the vulnerable community, customers, and seniors? Council can take the lead to mediate digital ageism by providing various communication channels to older adults, including the traditional paper and pen document and letters. Tackling ageism cannot be just lip service. It needs real actions. Providing adequate communication options 
to older people is the practical first move to truly inform, consult, involve, collaborate, empower older people. The motion tonight is only the start, and there is still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Councillor Goff, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I rise to speak to this motion to sort of look at this campaign and put it into some perspective. Manningham is a community that my last reading, and look, it's my reading of our, our statistics in our area, we're growing in two areas. We're growing in younger people, but we're also growing in that older group, uh, demographic group of people in our community. Uh, ageism is interesting because, you know, as, as we've gone on in a Western world, uh, compared to other cultures, and I'm saying different cultures, the concept of being old is in some ways being superfluous or not needing to be involved anymore. Your useful life has gone. I don't actually think that that's how we do think, but in practicalities in the fastness of our life, uh, that may be an interpretation that older people do have. Uh, I think it's important that we actually discuss this and, and put it out there that, yes, we are in a community, and even if it's just talking amongst council officers and the services that we provide and how we cater and how we reach out to our whole community, just to consider with a multicultural community about getting out in languages, uh, getting out information and engaging a community uh, that will cater for those that are of an elderly grouping and perhaps ones that aren't able to quickly access transport or get around or do things, be able to reach out to those people. Um, we do need to consider, um, I think, the, the programs that we have and ensure that what I believe is one of the, the biggest problems with our ageing community is social isolation. We have so many people living in single person houses uh, and perhaps with the breakdown of close relatives or, or anyone around, are really living alone. And I think an eye-opener is talking to people that do Meals on Wheels, where they might be the only person that these people actually see in a day and no one actually contacts them and rings them. So, you know, there are certain things on... At, at heat wave times, we want to see how our neighbours are and things like that, but there's an ability for our community to work together. And there's some exciting stuff that can come out of it too, Mr Mayor. And, and, and you know, the, the whole, I think it was a show on TV, but the whole concept of, of children in childcare or kindergarten going around and working with people in nursing homes, but it doesn't have to be a nursing home, it can be older people. And I know there's a, a barrier of, of police checks and everything else, but creating the connections between older people and young kids is really important, especially when we have become the most nuclear of nuclear family cultures around. Uh, often children do not have uh, two parents or whatever, but they also do not have grandparents around in their lives. And there are lots of kids that miss out on that. And I, I actually, on a personal note, suffered from that with my children because you know, uh, my children's grandparents had died by the time my uh, oldest was about four. So they had none. And luckily I had an aunt that was able to step in. But these are important people in, in people's lives and it involves the older people. But older people aren't useless either. Quite, uh, quite able to do lots of things and, and work well. So anything that actually gets that conversation going and promotes some activities to include those people and stop. There's one ugly part of ageism and that is being people being victimised. So, uh, Mr Mayor, I'll leave it at that without asking for an extension. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Um, are there any speakers against? Just speak to. Uh, Councillor Kleiner would like to speak to the motion. That's fine. Yes, thank you. Definitely not against, Mr Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think it's a, a wonderful initiative. It was actually going to be launched in 2020, but because of COVID, it was... Um, it's happening now. And um, as part of us passing this, I think it's wonderful, uh, there's proposed activities 
uh, that will go to highlight um, this message, which will help to debunk um, the myths and um, challenges of stereotypes of what it means to be older. And especially um, in Manningham, that we do live older, we are, um, which is wonderful. We live older and healthier um, than the average uh, metropolitan across the state, um, which I think is a great message. Uh, some of the specific messages will coincide with um, important key dates, of which one of them has just passed, which was um, National Volunteers Week. We've got coming up Elder Abuse Awareness Day in June and uh, International Day of Older Persons, which is in October. Uh, and it's wonderful to see that, um, I think it's uh, June 15, that the Mayor yourself should be part of the signing, which is uh, of a much bigger scale. I thought it's just really lovely to just highlight tonight that... Um, all councillors, once we pass this, will be signing the pledge. And that pledge, it's quite a beautiful pledge and I thought it'd be nice to read it. I stand for a world without ageism, where all people of all ages are valued and respected and their contributions are acknowledged. I commit to speak out and take action to ensure older people can participate on equal terms with others in all aspects of life. I think this is a clear reminder that when we look at even just the volunteers week that we've just had, you know, our volunteers are the backbone to our community and if you look across our city at Manningham, uh, the volunteers largely come from those that are affected by this. Elder abuse is a real thing. It does affect people. There are lots of sad stories. There's lots of horrific stories and there shouldn't be one, but they do sit here and also in Manningham. This is a beautiful pledge that we encourage, no matter how young, how wise we are, that we all appreciate one another, that message that resonates through, our, through us as a city, as part of our direction and our values, that every person is valued. And especially our, you know, our older, um, maturer, I like to call them wiser, because we can learn so much from our community. And without them, Manningham would be a very, very different place because we've got so many great people uh, that this affects and tonight this is about them. And we say thank you to our community at large that tonight we as a, a council um, pledge this, we stand up for this, we believe in this, it's not a tick and flick. I think we wholeheartedly, we see the value in what this can do to positively bring out great change, positive change in um, what can be a very, very lonely space. and. Um, a very isolating space. So um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we're endorsing tonight. Thank you, Councillor Kleinert. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Diamante. Thank you to um, the councillors for what you've said. I just want to make some key points about what councils, also the actions we're taking to address this. Um, Councillor Chen spoke of a, uh, ageism as the most invisible form of discrimination. And I would actually like to take one step further. I think ageism and elder abuse is probably the most insidious form of abuse. Um, it can take many forms. It can be very slow. It can happen over many, many years. Um, it's compounded by isolation. It's compounded by feeling invisible. I think it's also compounded by gender and some multicultural backgrounds. It can be quite a complex issue, financial, etc. Council has got actions within our draft council plan and within our draft budget to address the isolation of the elderly. The more that we engage, the more we can address or perhaps be more aware of some of these issues that are going on. Um, some of our actions include supporting community groups that are actively working with the elderly to socialise. It includes digital literacy programs and um, events to, to just get the elderly out and, and amongst the community. Um, transport options for the elderly is a critical way of making them more mobile so that they can get out and, and also increase their feeling of independence. And I forgot my last point and I was doing really well. Oh, creating safer places for the elderly to hang out, um, like libraries. Uh, in, in, the, in the olden days, they used to meet at church or in um, town squares or what have you. So creating safer places for the, the elderly to meet with the community, not just other old people, but, but all, all types. So I congratulate the council on what um, has been put in the draft council plan to address ageism. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Diamante. Any other speakers? Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And as pointed out by all, 
councillors. This is definitely a campaign where we, um, we are making the pledge that every age counts and that no matter what your age, that you are important and you are valued. I think a key thing to also mention in tackling ageism is educating and informing our community about what it is, um, how it occurs and how we can prevent it. And that is also part of this plan because um, providing people with information and having them as informed citizens makes them then more conscious of the decisions and the actions they make. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Are there any other speakers? I'll put that motion. Those in favour, encourage unanimously. Thank you, councillors. And as Councillor Kleiner mentioned, we will be signing the declaration shortly uh, at the conclusion of the meeting. Item 10, City Planning and Community. Sorry, hang on. I'll I'll go, I'll go to item 11, actually, given that we've already done item 10, uh, city services. 11.1, .1, Garden Waste Recycle Centre, decommissioning and closure and bushfire prone area initiatives. Do I have a mover? Thank you, Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Goff. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak for the motion? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I thought I would just start by actually reading the recommendation in full. Uh, so the recommendation is that Council notes that the Green Waste Recycle Centre will be permanently decommissioned and closed, and B notes that the continuation of the Garden Waste Disposal Days to be provided as ongoing with um, to be provide ongoing support to our bush fire prone area residents with management of their fuel loads um, on their properties all year round. Um, Mr Mayor and fellow councillors, the permit closure and the decommissioning of the Garden um, Waste Recycle Centre has had an impact on our community and has raised questions and concerns. Um, it is located at the corner of Webster's Road and Blackburn Road, Doncaster East. And um, it has occurred that there's been the identification of risk with the continued operation of the site. Um, the facility through the Resource Recovery Facilities Audit Task, Task Force um, regarding the um, CKM Recycling Coolaroo Fire and the State Government's Waste Management Policies has taken an effect and looked at the details and how to manage combustible recycling. And in that, it has been identified that if these facilities must minimise the risks or harms to people's health and the environment um, with the, these types of facilities. The risk that identifies is the stockpiling of garden waste material on site in a bush prior phone air, um, area such as where we had our Manningham Garden Waste Recycle Centre. Um, the situation was further compiled when we did actually have a small number of fires that had ignited from the actual stockpiling of our residents' green waste. As the facility was never actually a green waste um, organic processing plant, that then the waste did actually sit there until it was taken away. Um, to Manningham's credit, we have evaluated the risks of the site and we um, are about protecting our uh, residents and our environment. And we also were aware that this service was free to residents in a bush prior phone, air, bush, bush prior phone prone area. Alternatives were needed and were consult, um, devised and consulted um, with residents. And in the trial of that, um, initiatives came that we had the green waste disposal days and sites. These were evaluated as effective and as a favourable option and fitted within Council's expenditure costs. Residents had positive comments to share once attending the green waste disposal days, with recommendations of having bigger trailer loads and the opportunity for more trailer loads. Council have taken on this recommendation and are continuing with this initiative. In, 
consultation of the community feedback. They are continuing with the garden waste disposal sites for residents in um, bushfire prone areas. They are looking at uh, four disposal days with the option of residents being able to pay a small fee for trailer loads, extra trailer loads, once they have utilised their free allocation. I really look forward to the continua continuation of this initiative and I also look forward to receiving residents' feedback about the benefits and impacts of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Goff, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I think uh, Councillor Lang has done a, a, a stellar job on outlining uh, what has occurred and uh, what we're doing into the future, so I think everyone is very clear on that. Uh, I just want to say one thing on this, and that is that uh, we, we do live in one of the most bushfire-prone areas of Melbourne, and uh, one of the greatest areas of risk, as everybody knows, is Warrandyte, Warrandyte Township. Uh, basically, not many ways in and out of it. There's one bridge and then there's one road either side. So <clears throat> we are very uh, aware of those risks. And that's why I think it's important to note that council work in close uh, discussion with the landowners of the area, the CFA, and uh, the council working together to work on fuel reduction and especially on private property. We do our own bit on our public land, but that private property fuel reduction is so, so very important. And uh, indeed, the fact that we're closing it is not because we don't think it's important. It was just compliance and we're not a, a, a processing centre. And there are issues that were around that site that led us to needing to close it. But uh, the good point is and I think the very important point is that the people that own property out there, besides in the larger areas where you are able to get a permit to burn off at the certain times to reduce the fuel load on your properties, we do have for a lot of the other people that don't want to do that, an ability to bring garden waste in uh, to those locations close by uh, to, to them. And it is important that we are doing that. And I think the other important thing with bringing it in to that area is that we can actually talk to the residents that actually go there and talk to them about how to keep fuel loads down and other issues with regard to that. So it's a good uh, ability for education of our community of the risks of bushfire and all the rest. Now I know that the associations and other people around there do do a lot in that regard, but it's another point of contact for us to get to understand the needs of those people. And it's one way in which we can actually help out because it's, it's okay, it, a, a, a bin like the residences of Bulleen and Lower Templestow is pretty well useless when you've got five, ten acres or, or even an acre would be difficult to, to do in that. But in those particular bushfire areas where it's necessary to keep that load down, this is an important project which is continuing. It's just shutting that particular centre, but we're going out to them with an ability to drop the stuff off into containers and have it taken away straight away. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Were there any other speakers for the motion? Sorry, any, sorry, are there any speakers against the motion first? No, any speakers for the motion? I'll put the motion, those in favour? And carried, yeah, honestly, again, thank you, councillors. 11.2, Arundel Road West, Park Orchards, road closure. Do I have a mover? Councillor Lang. Have the recommendation be adopted. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Lightbody. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Mr Mayor and fellow councillors, I encourage you to support the permanent closure of Arundel Road West um, to through tra traffic at the intersection of Park Road, um, including uh, going out to our service authorities and seeking their approval and also the Department of Transport. Arundel Road is a sealed road between Park Road and Knees Road in Park Orchard and provides access to 23 properties. It, when it was built, it had extensive um, traffic management devices installed. However, over time, these management devices have not been enough and there has still been concern to those Arundel Road residents. <coughs> 
Residents of Arundel Road have raised extensive concerns and objections to the construction of a roundabout at the intersection of Knees Road and Arundel Road and are constre extremely concerned about Arundel Road being increasingly um, dangerous and a thoroughfare, particularly to um, school traffic and residents trying to avoid normal traffic congestion and at the moment also the Knees Road construction conge congestion. A community read, um, meeting was conducted by council and residents with 25 residents attendees, all supporting a permanent clo road closure of Arundel Road, Park Road, at the Park Road end, in order to prevent non-local traffic using the road as a shortcut and to improve um, the resident safety. Also to remove the need for a construction of a footpath along the street, which when you were out there on site seemed nearly impossible to be um, constructed. A turnabout area will be needed to um, be installed for larger vehicles to have movements such as our waste um, vehicles, waste collection vehicles, and residents understand. The proposed permanent closure of Arundel Road West at Park Road has um, been assessed and will not have any adverse impact on traffic in the area and has been um, proposed and sourced through Council's 2021-2022 budget allocation. Community consultation and notification will be sought according to our statutory processes under the Local Government Act 1989 of section 20, 223. 25 residents within Arundel Road state the main reasons for the community's um, support for the Arundel Road West permanent closure is, and they follow. Arundel Road has become a cut through due to increasing traffic using Knees Road and the congestion of Knees Road and Park Road. Drivers also tried to avoid waits and um, at local school crossings, therefore cut through to Arundel Road. Parents, are, when running late for school drop-offs, rush down this narrow road at speeds that are inappropriate for the street and resident safety. The new roundabout at Rundle Road um, has, concern, has um, created resident concerns and compiled to their um, worries for their safety. The street is narrow and does have uh, cranes and speed pumps to deter traffic. This is unfortunately not enough and there has been recent reports of number near misses and three accidents where children have been hit by cars. The most late, latest report was where a child was struck on his bike at the intersection of Park Road and Arundel Road by a driver using Arundel Road as a cut through on Thursday the 28th of April. Residents are asking for the opportunity to provide a delegation to represent the street in the consultation process and as you can see, they are all in favour of the Arundel Road um, closure due to the petition that was submitted earlier tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Uh, Councillor Lightbody, would you like to speak? Uh, is anyone speaking against the motion? I will put that motion. Those in favour, and that's carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. Eleven point three land encroachment policy. Do I have a mover? Councillor Chen. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Diamante. Councillor Chen, would you like to speak to the motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the good thing is, in Victoria, in most cases, there is no adverse position claimed against councils because of the legislative change. Uh, which came into force on the 1st of January 2005. That was about 16 years ago. But the issue of encroachment of council land remains. This policy applies to all council land encroached by abutting property owners and occupiers. When encroachment issue arises, Council will assess and manage the issue according to the proposed policy guidelines. The outcome may include the resolution for the abutting property owner or occupier to remove the occupation and improvements from Council's land 
and be responsible and, re, and be responsible for any rehabilitation and fencing costs. If it is not possible to rectify the encroachment, council and the property property owner can enter into a Section 173 agreement. If Section 173 agreement cannot be reached, then the land affected will be included within the land information certificate. The policy also includes the potential to have a register and charge an annual license fee. When the abutting property owner's property is sold, any license agreement terminates immediately, and the rehabilitation costs will be borne by the abutting property owner. The purpose of this policy is to promote property, fair dealing, and openness to all Manhattan ratepayers and landowners and residents, of course, and ensure that the procedure be conducted in an efficient, effective, and very transparent manner. So I ask my fellow councillors support to this proposed policy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Councillor Diamante, would anyone like to speak against the motion? Would anyone else like to speak for the motion? I'll put that motion. Those in favour and carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 12, Shared Services. 12.1, Proposed 2021-22 Budget and Draft Revenue and Rating Plan. Do I have a mover? So moved. Mr. Councillor Stephen Main, thank you. And do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Lightbody. Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the motion, please? Yes, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, well, this is an exciting uh, moment for the Council, our first uh, budget in this, uh, this four-year term. Um, so we're spending $133 million, um, which is uh, the biggest five elements of that uh, in the operating senses. The waste and recycling comes in at number one, $14.4 million, uh, $12.3 million for the maintenance of roads, drains, footpaths and bridges, and number three is $11.6 million for the maintenance of sports grounds and our parks and gardens. So I think that gives the, 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 the core of Council's operations, and then you have things like a, a very healthy... $48 million uh, capital works budget. Uh, we have stuck with our long policy at Manningham of, of dedicating 33% of our uh, budget to capital works, which not many councils do, which ensures that we do, we do have a priority allocation to ensure that our, our assets are kept up in, uh, in, uh, in very good condition. There's quite a few interesting initiatives in the budget. I'm particularly uh, pleased with the extra 100,000 for our libraries, which we've decided to do, which will mean that the Doncaster Library out here uh, from August to December during peak exam times for university and high school students will be open until nine in the evening rather than six in the evening. So it's an initiative that the council is taking uh, specifically just at the one library to extend the hours, including extending Sunday hours from three hours till five hours. So hopefully when you go there, you often see 40, 50 people there at closing at six o'clock. So it'll be great that the students know they've got some extra time during uh, their peak period. We've also decided uh, we don't have any particular major big projects that are on the horizon at the moment. Like if you look back in the past, we might have had an Aqua Arena or an MC uh, Squared or Mullum Mullum Stadium. So this has given us scope to f fire up and focus on the basics. So we have made a conscious decision to spend more on drainage, an extra 600,000 to 4.1 million, and more on footpaths, uh, more on, on cycle paths, tree plantings, things like that. We've made a, a deliberate decision to spend more. Uh, the process is a bit different this year. We don't, under the law, have to have a draft budget anymore under the new Local Government Act, but we've decided to voluntarily release a draft budget, which we're doing tonight, and we're going to have a two-week period of consultation. So we really do hope that we hear from the community before we approve a final budget uh, on June 28. And we've also decoupled this process from the four-year council plan, which traditionally came out at the same time, but now we've got an extra couple of months of the approved early in the, in the new financial year. So it's a slightly different process, but we really are sincere in saying that we want to hear um, from uh, our community about what they think about this, uh, this budget. Um, we've got a new strategic reserve of $12.5 million. We've, we've taken, uh, we used to have $8 million set aside for a potential defined benefit superannuation liability, which doesn't look like it's going to materialise. So we've been able to switch this money, plus the money we had from a former land sale, and create a, a, a new special 
$12.5 million strategic reserve for any strategic opportunities that come up. We are in a good financial condition. Our cash balance is, pro is projected to rise over the 12-month period by another $1.5 million to $83.5 uh, million. So we're in, we're in good shape. Uh, there are not many other councils that are in this uh, position. We do have flexibility to take on any big projects. We're signalling that there may be some things coming up with this, uh, with this strategic reserve. And I guess finally I should dwell on the rates that we've gone for the 1.5%, for, for the which is the government mandated uh, cap. Um, there's also a 13.5% increase in the waste charge because we've had a substantial increase in the state government tax and we do have full cost recovery uh, on waste. So the overall average bill for a, a typical resident will be up about 3% um, uh, for the year. Um, and finally, I just want to make a comment about rate capping that it's, it's amazing that the state government, uh, which back in 2014-15 when they came to office, they, they decided to, to cap council rates. And at the same time, when they started that, they were collecting, I think, 38% of council rate revenue in land tax. So we were getting about 4.6 as councils across the state, and the state government was getting only 38% of that. Now, having they've jacked up land tax so much, it's going up 15% this year. It's going to be 4.2 billion, up from 1.7 back in 2014 and 15. And they're projecting it's going to rise 9% each year over the forward estimates. So by the time we get to 2025, the state government is going to be taking as much in land tax from councils as we get, probably around five billion each, when, when they decided to come in and cap us, they were only getting 1.7. So they didn't say at the time, we're going to cap rates and we're going to just grab another three billion in property taxes off your unsuspecting community, but that's what they've actually done. And the hypocrisy of them saying, we're going to control every council in the state while they've just done a massive land tax grab is, is, I find it just quite amazingly hypocritical. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, it's a good budget. I'd like to thank the officers, John Gorsa, CFO, and everyone else who's worked on it. Looking forward to hearing some community contributions. Thank you, Councillor Main. Councillor Lightbody? Yep, I think uh, Councillor Main summed up the draft budget really well and the fact that we are taking out, it out for community consultation which was no longer required under the Local Government Act, but is a very important part of local democracy and community participation in our, in our council. Something else I'd like to highlight in the budget is the, uh, as Councillor Mayton did uh, mention as well, is the increase in funding for cycling and cycle infrastructure, as that aligns with our Healthy City strategy and our another strategy that's coming out shortly, which I've forgotten the name of off the top of my head. Yeah. Something else really interesting in the budget is the initial funding for the initial design of the uh, community toilet plan, which over the next 10 years will maintain, improve and build new community toilets, which will increase the accessibility of our public spaces and is a really important factor in many people choosing whether to go out to our parks and our shopping centres. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Are there any other speakers against? Are there any speakers against the budget? Are there any other speakers for the budget? Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to my fellow councillors who have already spoken um, very highly of the budget. I'd just like to say that the budget also does align with our community panel vision and that I am pleased to see that Council have continued to focus and, and have a retarget reduction in operating costs so that they can continue to focus on efficiencies and be financially stable. I'm also pleased, as Councillor Main said, about the establishment of the strategic fund and as it is an initiative to um, provide infrastructure development. Um, I'm also pleased to see that there is um, a good operating budget for the maintenance of our roads, drains, footpaths and bridges. Um, I'm also very um, pleased to see that the, there is money set aside for the maintenance of our sports um, grounds, parks and gardens and that as these are all core to our residents' safety and accessibility as well as a further amount has been set aside, $4.1 billion for drainage improvements, and that can be included in um, areas like our Wonka Park Sports Precinct. 
Um, I'm also pleased to see in our capital budget that there is money um, put aside for those current projects that are going, like our Jumping Creek Road upgrade, our Knees Road upgrade, and our Lions Park master plan. So I encourage our fellow councillors to um, put this um, proposed budget out to community consultation and for our community to have a look at it too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Di Monte. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you for my colleagues. Much has been said on the budget, and I just want to discuss three initiatives that I've been advocating for. Um, the first is the North East Link community advocacy to reduce the impact of the North East Link on the community and also those 70 businesses in Greenaway Street. Money has been allocated for council officers to continue to work with and advocate to the North East Link Authority to reduce the environmental and amenity impact to the Manningham community and those residents that will be most affected by this freeway. Um, and also to, to ramp up its advocacy for those businesses in Greenaway Street, including helping them to support their move away from Boleyn, which may also include mental health support, considering a considerable impact on those businesses. The next initiative that I'm particularly um, excited about is to explore opportunities for a local business hub or co-working space in Manningham. There are many, many small businesses, um, sole traders, many that are home-based in Manningham, <coughs> and a business, a business hub will just build partnerships, build opportunities for innovation, create economic outputs for Manningham, help businesses to, to generate new opportunities and new solutions and new markets. So I think it's an incredibly exciting opportunity for Manningham and depending on where, where it is, it could also represent an additional form of revenue for the council taking some pressure off rates. And the final one which we've spoken around ageism is um, the initiatives within it to support our elderly residents trying to combat their isolation through extended use of community facilities, including our libraries. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Diamante. Uh, I think I saw some other hands. Um, Councillor Chen and Councillor Main. And sorry, Councillor Clinton. Yeah, yeah, after, uh, after, yeah. I'll go. So, Councillor Chen, Councillor Clinton, Councillor Main. I thought I saw another hand. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to touch on the environmental and sustainability side of uh, part in the budget. And we probably still remember that on the on 28th of January last year, and Council uh, approved the motion to declare climate emergency. That is in our turn. And we are still very proud of it as a previous council, councillor at previous turn. And the highlight in the draft budget, uh, in my view, is about environment and sustainability. I just want to uh, highlight the increased side of the environment but, uh, budget on environment. Council allocate 14.4, as Councillor uh, May already pointed out, for waste and recycling. That is an increase of 1.4 million from the previous budget. And Council further allocates uh, 5.4 million for integrated strategic planning, urban design, and environmental service to make Manhattan a more livable city. Council also proposed $800,000 for environmental initiatives, including solar panels in the environmentally sustainable design program. Because of last year's COVID restrictions, perhaps we'll now come back to the restrictions again, Willie really Musk. Residents can appreciate about our open space, parks, and you name it. So spending on parks and open space and streetscapes also increases from 3.9 million from the last financial year to 4.1 million. As a World of War counselor, I'm happy to report to my constituents that the Turkish Road footpath reconstruction in Templestowe Finally, finally, on the agenda, and I wish to thank my constituents for bringing that to my attention and their continuous advocating uh, efforts for this project. Council allocates $4 million to complete the long 
uh, awaiting project into two financial years. So we including one million in 21-22 financial year. Once completed, the project will benefit greatly to Sipo Primary School uh, community, residents, sporting clubs, and aged care facilities around the uh, uh, around Turkus Road area. And our beloved Tom Kelly Athletic Track, the only athletic facilities in Manhattan, open to public 24-7, will receive $1.2 million for improvement. So there's other uh, small uh, projects uh, to upgrade our uh, playgrounds in our local reserves, so I don't have to emphasize that here. So overall, we listen to the community, so we spend a lot more on environment and uh, our open space. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Councillor Kleiner. Thank you, Mr Mayor. You can tell that we're quite excited about it. We're all wanting to speak. Uh, um, and it's been well said. It's just a couple of things that I really wanted to highlight with regards to just the way Manningham, the way we run. And one thing that I think we should be really proud of is um, the new process of the, the uh, community panel that we had, which was uh, fantastic. It was state government driven. We had to do it, but we did it in a great way. And it's been a really great process. But we didn't have to then go out, like um, Councillor Lightbody said, to um, a draft to go out again. But we are, because we're transparent and we're wanting to show our community that we really care. Each of us nine councillors live and breathe our city. And you know we listen to our constituents, but we don't get everyone in that when we, when we hear. It's one thing uh, to note that in talking to many other municipalities, they don't have budget principles like we do. And I really, I'm, I'm really um, proud that we've stuck to our financial um, principles. And I thought I'd just share them. So council's long-term financial plan principles, that we're financially sustainable council. We don't get the, the luxury of some other councils that get money thrown at them like no tomorrow. And you know we try and we advocate, we do our best, but we don't always get that money because of course there's some political challenges to that. Um, our second one is we live within our means. We do not spend more than we have, or which will diminish council's long-term financial sustainability. Because as an example, uh, if we were one that just splashed the cash and were already in debt, we'd be in big trouble with the rate cap, because rate cap over a long term does affect us. And so that's why we are very conservative today, because the way state government changes things, that means that we have to change what we do, we need to make sure that we're already future-proofing and we look at that. We prioritise, we prioritise our funding, align resources to council plan and priorities and fund projects based on demonstrated need. Now this is an interesting one because in fact our council plan doesn't actually get endorsed until later in this year. We're in the midst of it. Um, we, we're working through that but we're already endorsing a budget uh, without really having endorsed the council plan. That's the state government's throwing that on us and we're, doing, we're, we're behaving ourselves and we're doing it as in line with state government. But it's something to be mindful of that you know, we've, we've still got that flexibility as we move forward. The financial sust sustainability of surplus over the life of the long-term financial plan assisting um, to assist council's um, extensive capital works program, a minimum of 33%. And I think we've done really well with that. Um, priority to fund renewal um, before new. Um, or expand our assets. And I think that's a really uh, strong thing because you know, uh, Manningham is about 50 years old. A lot of our infrastructure is sitting about the same um, birth year or yield. And, um, you know, lots of things have changed. There's lots of, um, you know, our, our community is growing, yet our, our space of, of community uh, space hasn't. So, you know, looking after the renewal before that. And then the most important one that I'm really, um, I like is one of our principles is consistent funding for technology and innovation. And if I take us back to a, a, a few years ago, that's one thing that we focused on. And having put money into that focus meant that when we went into COVID, our municipality, our staff were ready to go to work from home, um, to have that capability because we did see that as a priority and I'm glad that it's still a, pri a priority because technology and innovation is so important to the sustainability of our council. It's a great um, draft budget. It's open again. It will be revisited uh, in June at our 
our last council meeting, but I think it's been a, a wonderful uh, collaboration of councillors, of staff, and thank the staff for all that they've done to contribute to help us get through this in uh, this time as a new council. Thank you, Councillor Quinet. Um, Councillor Laura Young. Sorry, Laura, oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry, I know someone called Laura Young. Laura May. Thank you, Mr Mayor. You are young. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, just a few other things I'd like to point out with the budget. As many of the other councillors have already mentioned, it does have great community consultation. Um, that with the community panel, you'll see Manningham, and of course this two-week period of further community consultation. Um, as Councillor Main has already pointed out, it has does have good financial stability. However, we are trying to balance that with aiming to give back to the community the best that we can. Um, I'd also like to point out the council group has been reconsidering this budget up until very recently with the new additions that I might want to um, point out to with the car share feasibility, which will address traffic and a few environmental concerns, as well as looking to new public art at Mount Lum Stadium and additional funding to our footpaths and roads, which is getting the basics right, as we all aim to do. Um, a few of the things that I'm glad to see in the budget is the focus on community, which of course community is the heart of every council. You'd hope there is a focus on community. Um, that including improved mental, mental health focus, exploring the idea of a youth hub, considering gender equality impact assessment across the entire budget, which is a new thing we're doing, and exploring educational programs which include all members, which, which aim to be inclusive of all members of our community as well as improved environmental focus, as Councillor Chen did already point out, that including um, increasing advocacy to business and other levels of government and more explore, exploration of conserving our biodiversity. Again, a big focus of the community panel, and that including collaborating with the Wurundjeri Wurrung Community Heritage Aboriginal Corporation. So yeah, that was just a few of the things that I was glad to see in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Are there any other speakers? I will therefore put the motion. Those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. And we, we now move to item 12. Sorry, hang on, 13. Get that far enough away so I can read the numbers. Um, Chief Executive Officer, 13.1, Manningham Quarterly Report, quarter three, January to March 2021. Do I have a mover? Councillor Goff? So, Mr Mayor is on the paper. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Stephen Main. Councillor Goff, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. It's very frustrating to wear a mask because every time if you've got glasses, it fogs up uh, and you've got your mask on. But Mr Mayor, uh, I'm, I'm proud to uh, move this quarterly report and I'd like to congratulate the organisation uh, for the position that we are in at this very time. Uh, it's been a very difficult year and I suppose this quarter was one of the first quarters that we've had that have not been marred by COVID in, in a major way, even though it had, oh, sorry, it has had some uh, COVID stuff because we, we're slowly getting back. In the first two quarters of this financial year, we were certainly fully in uh, COVID and also through an election process. And so in order to keep the ship going to the level that we're at now, I have to congratulate our organisation. I also congratulate the organisation on that um, dashboard that we've got. It really succinctly indicates the position that we're in, the issues that we're confronting uh, and what is challenging us at the moment, and an explanation that goes beside it uh, as to why we are in the position that we are in at the moment. And overall, it is good news. Uh, now, in the capital terms, yes, we've readjusted our budget because there are a couple of projects that we're not going to, we know now, we're not going to be able to get through. But instead of just, we have adjusted it down a bit, but the adjustment down is a great deal more than that. Um, so what we're doing is we're reallocating those resources to other projects. And I suppose if you look at uh, 3.1.4 in the report, it talks about uh, what we are reallocating to and, 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 and doing going through that process. Um, in financial terms, um, we've spent more. But the report really clearly points out that where we've had uh, more costs with uh, employment, we've employed, uh, paid out, the grants from the state government, and a lot of, a lot of our blowout was, was uh, in equipping and, and, and safety things for a whole lot of new workers that we've got. 
The funding from that came from the Victorian Government, which is shown in, in the grants column, but it will sort of look at the figures, and it's really good that the explanation is there, because there were many, many people working in Manningham with a Working Victoria proje project as COVID was going on, and people would have noticed the people walking around polishing lampposts and, and signs and all sorts of things around in our community and cleaning, cleaning our public infrastructure. Uh, and, and that was an important thing for the time, and believe me, we might be doing it again um, very soon with that. But again, uh, it hasn't deterred us from getting on with our projects. And I think if we look at our, our major initiatives uh, that we're going through this year, and it sort of it set, sets out here, and I think it's page, jeepers, what is the page? Um, 176 and 177. Um, on, on, on uh, tonight's agenda, and it just sort of highlights uh, major indicators in our major projects that we're going through. And uh, some of them there uh, that are dear to, dear to my heart, and one of them is drainage, and it's really good to see that uh, I think there's some drainage ones I think it was in Warrandyte, uh, there was some major drainage works, and I do know that in Berlin, because I actually had to travel past it for many months, uh, some major drainage works in uh, Rose Avenue, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I think it was Rose, uh, Rose Avenue. Uh, but uh, again, th th that's a very important a area w within uh, the whole catchment of, of that area of Lower Templestowe and Boleyn that has on numerous occasions, and I think in my lifetime four times been flooded and, and, and house damage and all that, in increasing our drainage capacity in those areas strategically is so important. And these are things that, going back to our budget, that aren't really things that you can cut a ribbon for and all the rest, but they are essential uh, infrastructure that we need in our community and it is one of the first priorities and we need to spend money on those things to get that right. And uh, again, uh, we're, we're tracking well and I think everything that, that we've put out on, on this report uh, and being very open with, with all things is really good and I just love reading the actual diagrammatical version of it more than the, uh, the text version of this report because it really clearly indicates how we're travelling overall. So indeed, we have um, had, had some money coming in. We uh, have spent a little bit more, but we've, we've, that's been tem tem tempered by other things. So with that, Mr Mayor, um, I'd like to uh, say that we should pass this and really celebrate the good achievements here and work on the areas, and it's indicated in there, I think there were seven, I think it was seven um, projects that we don't think are going to get completed in time, and that was seven out of 262. So uh, that's still a pretty good success rate uh, for an organisation that's been working in difficult times. Thank you, Councillor Goff. And Councillor Main. Councillor Stephen, no, nothing to say? Um, would anyone like to speak against the orderly report? Motion? No. Uh, anyone else like to speak for the motion? No? I will therefore put that vote. And thank you. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, so, and that brings us to item 13.2, report on the conduct, conduct of the 2020 general elections. Do I have a mover? Councillor Laura May. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Lightbody. Councillor Laura May, would you like to speak to the motion? I'll just speak briefly. Um, I'd just like to thank the officers for their report and their hard work tackling lots of new issues this election, as they were a big part of making my first experience with the bureaucratic process such a smooth process. Um, for context, the general public who did not experience running an election, some of these new changes were to do with new, um, the new Local Government Act 2020, considering things such as new, new ward boundaries, the voting system, candidate qualifications and more, as well as lots of hurdles tackling COVID. And I'd also just like to thank our engaged residents, as there was only 2.5% in formal votes compared to the 5% state average, which I was very happy to read. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Um, Councillor Lightbody. Yep, I'll just add another statistic to that as well. And many had a much higher participation rate this election compared to the last election. 
88% of eligible voters voted this election compared to only 78% in 2016. And that is above the state average of all local government areas, which is only 84%. So I think I'd like to congratulate all the community and their engagement in that. They're also at home all the time, so they have a lot of more time to get engaged. And also for all the other candidates and our councillors here who participated in the process and got their communities engaged. Thank you, Councillor Lightbody. Are there any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for? Councillor Stephen May. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. There's lots of amazing statistics in this report. Um, I was in interested to read that uh, they received 64,984 votes by the deadline, which was Friday, October 23. And then with Aussie Post being so le less reliable these days, they accepted another 12,402 uh, votes for ballots that came in after that. So I'm glad they've changed the legislation to allow something which is postmarked uh, by the date but arrives uh, later. And the other thing I think is uh, it was good that we didn't have massive fields. So we had the nine wards and we had between four and six candidates in each. And I think that's contributed to the very low informal vote of only 2.52% compared to 4.76% statewide. Uh, and it was 5.46% last time in Manningham. So when you had the three by three and you had the big fields, more people, one in 20, voted informally. Yeah. Um, so it's always good to see, you know, an 88% turnout and an informal vote of 252 That is a really, really good democratic franchise, if you think about it. You know, long live Australia's uh, compulsory voting, uh, you know, not having to get the vote out, you know, which just soaks so much from so many other democracies. So they have a culture where people turn out. I mean, I know they're all locked at home, and so they, uh, there wasn't much else going on except, uh, except taking interest in the council election. But a couple of other statistics. Um, 1,142 votes were returned to sender, not known at this address. Um, 1,342 people re requested replacement ballots, so maybe they were some of the same people. Um, and 1,775 people didn't sign their form, so they were uh, not deemed to be um, an informal vote. But all up, it was great that we had such a good uh, turn up. It was a really good campaign. There was nothing nasty in it. There were no dirt sheets. It was all very run, well run professionally. Thank Brian Kelly and Regina Koo, who were the two uh, VEC officers who, who jointly uh, um, ran the process. And, um, and well done to the VEC for writing and producing this really interesting report on how they conducted our elections. Thank you. Stephen May. Um, are there any other speakers? No? I'll put that motion. Those in favour? Encourage you unanimously. Thank you, councillors. And that takes us to item 13.3, appointment of authorised officers, Planning and Environment Act 1987. Do I have a mover? Councillor Kleinert? That the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Uh, a seconder? Councillor Lang, Councillor Kleinert? No. <laughs> Councillor Lang, any, other, any speakers against the motion? Uh, any speakers for? I will put that motion, those in favour and carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Moving on to 13.4, informal meetings of councillors. Do I have a mover? Councillor Lang? That the um, recommendation be adopted, Mr Mayor. Thank you. And uh, I have a seconder, Councillor Diamante. Um, I will put that motion. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Item 13.5. Documents for sealing. Uh, do I have a mover? Councillor Kleinert. I move with the recommendation being adopted with the additional of the following agreements, lease, council and the secretary to the Department of Transport for the State of Victoria, part 7A, Kim Close Boleyn, consent to build over an easement agreement under section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, council and G. J. Moody and A. V. Moody, 17 Park Hill Way, Doncaster, consent to build over an easement agreement under section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, Council and E, uh, sorry, and A. E. and T. K. Balmoral Proprietary Limited, 11 Balmoral Avenue, Templestowe Lower. Thank you, Councillor Kleiner. Did we get all that? Yep. <laughs> Just <for you. laughs> 
I didn't, I didn't get it after that, the recommendation being adopted. It's all right, so no. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, councillor, sorry. Um, sorry, and do we have a seconder? I think that's what I'm up to. Councillor Lang. Um, I will put that motion. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 14, urgent business. There is no urgent business as from previously. Item 15, councillors, question time. Councillors, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Councillor Diamante. Councillor Mayne, oh, sorry. I, I saw you first. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have two. Two, if I may. Um, so, Mr Mayor, are you aware that a very long-term Manningham resident and former president of the Warrandyte Historical Society received a Royal Historical Society of Victoria Award of Merit. Valerie Polly, OAM, has been a tireless volunteer for the Warrandyte Historical Society for many years and instrumental in furthering the development of the society. Val's done many, many things throughout her work for the society. And I, would, I have many dot points, but I would just like to list a few. Uh, nine years as, as secretary that includes council liaison and external bodies, maintaining files, preparing agendas, organising AGMs, curated research and completed a number of displays for the museum, including um, a gold room at the museum, temporary exhibits including Stars of Warrandyte, The Streets Where We Live, etc. Developed and run tours of Warrandyte's history, uh, created and delivered the program of events for the Society's 40th anniversary celebrations, authored books for the Society including Wonderful Warrandyte, A Portrait and War and Warrandyte 1914 to 18. She's been a regular archivist, um, managing volunteers, responding to requests for information, uh, applying for and receiving grants for the Society, participating in school visits, it's quite a lot she's been doing, um, presented talks to other societies and at the Association of Eastern Historical Societies Conference, um, assisted in the delivery of series of talks for members in the community, writing history articles for the Warrandyte Diary, and been awarded life membership of the Warrandyte Historical Society and an OAM for her services to Warrandyte, including to the Historical Society. Needless to say, once nominated, the Royal Historical Society of Victoria had no hesitation in presenting such an impressive and standout volunteer the Award of Merit for Exceptional Service to History in Victoria. The award was presented to Val at the Royal Historical Society of Victoria AGM on the 18th of May by Elizabeth Jackson, Vice President, and Richard Broom, AM President. As Chair of the Heritage Advisory Committee and a councillor at Manningham, I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank Val for her work on preserving and communicating Warrandyte's rich history and congratulate her on receiving this award of merit. Thank you, Councillor Diamante. And you had another question. I have one more, Mr Mayor. Thank you for making us aware. Okay. Um, and Mr Mayor, Another recognition, are you aware that the parish priest of St Gregory the Great in Doncaster, proudly part of Tullamore Ward, my ward, has been appointed as a, an, an auxiliary bishop within Melbourne's Archdiocese. And I wonder if it's Doncaster and Manningham's first bishop, which we're very proud of. Uh, Monsignor Island has been a parish priest at St Gregory the Great in the Doncaster Parish for nearly 12 years, supporting residents in Doncaster and Manningham, as well as responsibility for the faith education for hundreds and hundreds of students that have attended and continue to attend St Greg's Primary School. He regularly visits nursing homes, um, providing support to hospitals and welcoming visits to many of our elderly and vulnerable residents. During COVID, he coordinated an ongoing phone-based outreach program to our elderly and isolated people and as soon as rules would allow, would visit them in their homes. The mental and spiritual health and wellbeing of Manningham's residents has been his priority. He's active in supporting St Vincent de Paul and tells me that he regularly finds homeless Manninghamites on his doorstep where he will give them food and, and comfort I know that many of our community will miss him when he takes up this bishop role. 
in the end of July. And I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous contribution Monsignor has made over the last 12 years to the Doncaster Parish and the wider Manningham community and congratulate him on this papal appointment as Auxiliary Bishop. Thank you. Thank you for making us aware, Councillor Diamante. Um, Councillor Laura May. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to ask, when is our affordable housing policy coming to Council for review? Thank you. I'll refer that to the CEO. Uh, thank you, Councillor Main. I've been informed that um, our policy will be coming to the Council sometime in September, um, off the back of Council back in August 2020, uh, endorsing the uh, Regional Charter for Homelessness and Social Housing. So that's guided our thinking to this point, and the policy will be coming to Council, as I said, in September. Thank you. Are there any other questions from councillors? Yes. Councillor Chen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to raise a question, which is really important to our community. And as we know that the clothing and electronic waste are two of the fastest growing waste categories in Melbourne. And in fact, e-waste uh, is growing three times faster than any other categories in municipal, uh, any other type of municipal waste. And almost 90% of the materials used to make electrical items such as laptops, iPhone, can be recycled. And I have received not one, but some of the uh, uh, residents, they inquired about the e-waste hubs in Manningham, not for uh, large electrical items, but for small electrical items. And can officers consider and investigate the possibility of setting up uh, e-waste drop-off uh, hubs, similar like, just like a closing bin that we can see around our municipality in, at certain locations, such as Stepon, to receive all small electrical items. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll refer that to the CEO to come back at it through an SBS process, or would you like to respond? Um, Unless the Director of City Services might, might want to provide okay. a response, yep. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you, Councillor Ten, for your question. There are a number of options available currently for residents of Manningham to dispose of electronic waste that are included on the Manningham website. Some of these include booked um, hard rubbish, where we've got two free hard collections a year where we pick up um, electronic waste. And there's also uh, waste drop-off of day events every year. However, with COVID last year, we postponed that event. But we did hold an event early this year. And there's also a number of um, listed recycling and drop-off locations across Manningham that are listed on our website and that neighbouring councils have on offer for Manningham residents. In addition, we're looking at new initiatives into the new year that will look at further options for disposal of e-waste and using some of our community facilities where, where residents can go and drop off their small electrical items. Um, and we're happy to partner with other councils as well as looking at state government initiatives for further funding. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Were there any other questions from councillors? No. Um, item 16, confidential reports. There are no confidential reports. And thus, we come to the close of the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance.